Hi, my name is Jeffrey Kaplan. I am the executive chef and operations manager at Rally Farmhouse Ales. Um, I wear many, many different hats uh, because we're a new business, uh, along with my partner, John Rally, who wears many, many hats as well. We do everything we need to do to get the job done on a daily basis. And when you and John met, like, what made you guys decide, like, we're gonna open a brewery? When we met, we were just kind of drinking buddies at first. Uh, we actually met at a uh, Deschutes beer dinner um, down downtown Santa Fe, I think they were bringing Red Trolley into the state or something like that. So it was like one of their new releases. Okay. Um, and then we just kind of hit it off. We've been friends ever since. Um, and then a few years ago, we just started talking about uh, doing something together. I I had been wanting to do like a farm to table gastro pub kind of thing for a while, uh, looking for the right opportunity, the right location, and that kind of stuff. And, and then it had come up that he was looking to do like a, a farmhouse brewery and wanted to do food as well. And, and it just seemed like our, our goals meshed really well. And so then uh, in, in 2014, we started talking about doing something, uh, you know, a lot of pipe dream over beer, like, oh, we should do this, or we should do that. Um, but then we just kind of kept moving forward and. And then in the beginning of 2015, we, we formed a corporation and, uh, you know, and started looking for a, a location and where we could where we could make this happen, where we could have a brewery, and a kitchen, and a dining room, and a tap room. And, you know. We opened Labor Day weekend of 2016, so uh, a little over a year and a half now, mm -hmm. um, coming up on our two-year anniversary this September. Was it always? The idea to like to pair the food with the beer and like make those two complementary. Oh yeah, I mean yeah. they go so well together, and so, you know we kind of have similar views on using kind of heirloom ingredients, unique ingredients. John does that with the beer, I do that with the food. Uh, we actually import a uh, an heirloom wheat uh, that nobody else in the state uses okay. uh, for a lot of our beers. It's uh, from the Sonoran Desert actually. Um, that it, it, it's a it's actually called Sonoran White Wheat, and it's from the Sonoran Desert, and uh, we, we import that. We actually drive down to Tucson area and fill up a truck and drive it back, oh, you know, a couple few times a year because, you know, we'll go buy like a thousand pounds or two, and it's, you know, it's part of a lot of our beers. We do, we do some clean beers, okay. uh, and then we also do some Brett beers, okay. um, and we have a few different strains of yeast that we use, both on the clean beer side and the wild yeast side. Okay. Um, we have a, our house culture that John created, uh, starting out with uh, one uh, uh, type of Britannomyces from Europe, and then kind of it was able to incorporate some local wild Britannomyces into the strain. Okay. And then then he banked it at a yeast bank, so we could go back to that original strain. Um, you know, they keep they keep it at sub-zero temperatures in cryostasis, and then when we want more, we tell them. And, pretty common thing in the brewing industry. Very cool. um, so you can always go back to, you know, because you can only use, reuse yeast so many times before it starts to change and do other things. And so we can always go back to that original house strain. So what are the challenges involved with specializing in, in this type of beer in sours with these specialized yeast? Well, it does uh, make it a little challenging for producing clean beer sometimes. Uh, the, the Britannomyces is everywhere. Um, you can smell it in here right now. Yeah. It doesn't it doesn't I mean it still smells like a brewery, yeah. but you can smell that funkiness uh, that comes from the wild yeast um, that's coming out of the fermenters as we speak. Um, so it makes it a little challenging sometimes. If there's a, a clean beer, we have to pay extra special attention to make sure that uh, it doesn't get contaminated and uh, then we have to throw it away if it's not what we intended. Um, fortunately we haven't had to do that yet. Our team's really good at keeping things clean and separated, um, but uh, it is a challenge without a doubt. You have to stay like extra diligent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then talk to me about the bottle program, why you guys chose to go with the bottling program. 
Um, well, we like to do bottle conditioning. Okay. Uh, so we do natural carbonation, uh, similar to like champagne, as opposed to forced carbonating our beer. Okay. Uh, John likes the mouthfeel of that better and the, what it does for the flavor profile. Uh, it makes a more refined product and uh, more boutique, which is what we are. We're not, we're not looking to become the next big brewery in the state. That's not what our goals are. Uh, obviously, we want to grow a little bit, but not, I mean, not much. We have a seven barrel system. We're very happy with that. And, uh, and so we want to stay boutique. Our germophile is one of our core Berliner Weiss. Uh, so it's a lacto-fermented uh, sour wheat beer, mm -hmm. or tart wheat beer. Uh, it is, uses clean yeast, so it doesn't use any Britannomyces in it. Um, I can't tell you off the top of my head what yeast they use. I don't, I don't remember. Um, but it's not kettle soured. It's actually like a lacto-fermented Berliner Weiss, traditional style, so no kettle souring. Okay. Um, and uh, it's a really delicious, tart, clean Berliner. Does it take longer to ferment these styles? Some of them, yes. Yeah. You know, anytime you're using Britannomyces, it just takes takes a long time. Um, you know, it, it sometimes it's months, sometimes it's a year, or sometimes it's longer. You, you'll taste a beer and be like, eh, it doesn't taste right. You'll come back to it a few months later. Hey, it's really tasting really good right now. Um, I know we had that happen with a beer that we made. Uh, right as we opened, actually, uh, that we were going to serve at Winter Brew, mm -hmm. and uh, it was like a dark saison, wild fermented bread saison, and it, it tasted delicious. And then we were going to put it on some fruits, some, like some dark uh, cherries, currants, stuff like that, almost like a fruitcake kind of beer. Oh, okay. And uh, put it on the fruit, came and tried it a few weeks later, and it tasted terrible. Uh, all that sugar that was in the fruit just kind of woke the bread back up and it started fermenting again and it just was putting out a bunch of bad flavors. Um, so rather than throwing it away, we wanted to see what would happen. So we put it down in our basement, came back to it like a year later, it tasted delicious. Really? Yeah. That's very cool. Yeah. Took it off the fruit. Okay. Yeah. yeah. At that point we took it off the fruit, like, okay, you got enough of that. Yeah. And uh, put it down in the basement and uh, just let it sit for a year and then we ended up serving it um, this last winter, because it's like a, kind of like a dark saison, so it's a perfect winter kind of beer. Very cool. um, yeah, it was delicious, and it was kind of thing like you just kind of. Sometimes you have to try let it just sit and, and see what it and see what it does. Do. And if it doesn't, if it comes around, great. If it doesn't, there's the drain. You know, we've been really lucky. We haven't really had to do that. John Rowley is a great brewmaster, and our brewers Tyler and Wes are just are great people and great brewers as well. And We've been we've been really fortunate. You know, we have good practices. We keep the place clean, and uh, good controls, and we haven't had to throw out any beer yet. That's awesome. Yeah. If, if you're, you're not, not drinking, drinking Rally Farmhouse, Farmhouse ales, then you. Perfect. <laughs> that